All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the We Are One podcast. Uh, it's Justin, per usual. I'm pretty excited to jump into this conversation that um, we've got planned today. Um, Rhea, welcome back hey. to the show. Um, you want to you wanna tell everyone who you brought with you, too? I brought with my dad today. Last time I talked about my ayahuasca experience, and my dad was the one who convinced me to go with him to do that, and I was like one of the pivotal changing moments in my life so i thought he would be a good person to bring with i've liked i've liked watching your evolution <laughs> over the yeah. last couple of years it's been really cool it's been quite a wild ride yeah yeah um i there, so i wanted to, so jason welcome to you also Thanks but Rhea, i wanted to i wanted to start with you to have the mic because we are we a lot of what we have planned i feel like jason might be holding the mic for a long time once we get into <laughs> it but i wanted to to kind of update people on um, the job that you were like just starting yep. the last time we talked and, and kind of give us a, a rundown of what that looks like, how you're feeling about it, um, and what your day-to-day has been at that job. I know you're on the back end of a 16-hour shift yeah. just today. <laughs> I would be tired as shit, so so I I commend you for um, getting up and, I'm just and earning getting my out. stripes at my job, I guess. That's, yeah. that's what I would consider it. Yeah, so, so tell us a little bit. What has your experience been like working in... Uh, what what would you consider? Is it a wet house or is it a harm reduction facility or is it? Just I think it's 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 a mix of harm reduction and it's like the long term permanent, long term to permanent housing for some of these guys. It just it's due to their situation. I'm starting to see that not everybody comes from the same place or was given the same opportunities as uh, the majority. And then I also see the flip side too, where. In my opinion, there are some people who are just dependent on this now, and they're not really learning um, independence to bring themselves back out, you Mm -hmm. know? But Mm -hmm. I'm starting to realize, too, that that's not possible for all people, and that, like, the four agreements, like, do your best, but everybody's best looks really different and i've got to you know withhold a lot of my own judgment my a lot of my own preconceived notions about people and what i think people should do and um just being objective and giving basic human decency at every at every interaction or trying my hardest to like like i said my best and everyone else's best isn't going to look the same day to day Mm -hmm. so it's it's been uh, i think a true test to my own character and how i treat people and how I react to situations like it's because I have to be calculated in the way I react with my clients because I can't just say the first thing that comes to mind you right. know when someone's having a bad day I have to be you can't just be like come on fuck you Dave yeah you're, you're being a dick yeah like yeah. get the fuck out of my face I have to I have to be assertive I have to be I have to set boundaries but I have to do it with respect you know I have to do it with some level of human decency and mm-hmm. like because the whole reason why they're there and we work there is because we want to give that to them and that's what they need, you know, Mm because out on the streets, not everybody's going to be giving them human decency. A lot of majority of the population, I feel like, looks at homeless people like that's your fault, you know, that you're there. Mm -hmm. And I I won't lie, I have those moments sometimes where they're having a bad day and they don't want to be there and I'm like, that's your fault that you're here. But at the same time, like, it it is and it isn't, you know. Mm -hmm. I feel like it really... It just depends on the case. I think for a lot of people, it might be difficult to wrap your head around the idea of like, for some of them, that is the best foot that they're putting yep. forward. I think <clears throat> even from my perspective, that's kind of hard to wrap my head around a little bit because, you know, I I like to assume that people will, people are capable of mm-hmm. more, even more than what they are doing. Like, I feel like we're all capable of more, right. or at least the majority of us. There's a few people in the world that I think are doing absolutely everything that they can be doing, right? Mm-hmm. But not really many. So I, I feel like I'm a little bit, <clears throat> It that's hard for me to wrap my head around. Right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it sounds like it has been a little bit for you too. Yeah, it is. I, I, I had the, like, the situation I had yesterday where the guy was, fuck you bitch, and yelling in my face and being mean to me and trying to pick me apart and make me feel bad. It just, it was, it really, in that moment, it's hard. It's really hard to separate yourself and go, that person feels terrible. Mm -hmm. And not to think about, you're being mean to me. You're you're treating me this way, you know? Like, Mm -hmm. that person is probably having one of the worst days that they've had. And you, for some reason, are there and you get to be the brunt end of it. So... 
and how I react, I feel like, really reflects on my character. It's just another one of those times where the way somebody else treats me, the way somebody is to me, isn't going to make me change my character. I'm still going to stand up for myself and tell you, hey, you can't talk to me like that, but that's as, as far as I can do, mm -hmm. you know, because I'm not going to change him. I'm not going to, I can't force him to do anything. I can't force him to change himself. All I can do is kind of set that example and be that way, you know, respond in a, in a po in the most positive manner I can. It's hard to respond positively when someone's screaming at you, "Fuck you, bitch!" Right. <laughs> like, it's because you difficult. don't you don't have liquor for them, right? Or yeah, you or don't they, have beer. They with ran them. out of liquor themselves. We don't provide the booze right. for these guys. They buy it themselves through you know many means that they have at their disposal. So, I mean, we get to we hold it though. We hold all the booze because we have to cut it off at some point. You know, that's the point of harm reduction. Is like you don't just go balls to the wall all the time mm -hmm. you know that's that's not harm reduction that's full-blown addiction that's you actively you know hurting yourself harm reduction is to reduce the harm mm -hmm. take away the opportunity where you fall and crack your head open take away the opportunity where you get into a fight with someone you know things like that so Do run to decide when they've had enough like yes like, I, I think you've had enough you're, you're like a bartender like Yes. <laughs> yes. I, it's definitely, and, and now that I've been there a month, I know them and I know their personalities. I've seen them at seven in the morning. I've also seen them at 10 at night. So I know, um, I know the kind of meds that they take. I know what their booze is. I know who drinks vodka and who drinks beer. I know who eats and who doesn't eat. Mm -hmm. So I kind of can gauge at the best of my ability with deductive reasoning, like, okay, this is where you're at. If you are falling and stumbling and you can, can and, and, you're light you're not good on your feet i'm not going to let you have any more of your alcohol you can take a break for a couple of hours there's potential for you to hurt yourself yes. or that's kind of what you said before was that that's the point in time when you decide mm -hmm. okay you've had enough is when there is potential for someone to hurt themselves or yes. hurt someone else mm -hmm. um how many people are housed in in the facility that you work at i think it's a total it's, it's got to be upwards of towards a hundred people. Almost, oh, really? Just oh, about. Damn. There's like as far as residents. Yes, there's fifty people on this side. About. Um, and I was I was thinking like ten people. No, also, there's a lot of people. Wow. I and I I memorize almost all of their names. Props to you on that. Yeah. Well, I they they a lot of the guys wear the same thing every day and okay. like or they they vary in their outfits. So and like it's not Bob very much. like is always like bob yeah in his personality and what he's wearing yep and dude's got like he's got a camo hat and his backpack is camo so he i'm i'm every day i'm grabbing his beer out of the camo backpack and he's got the camo hat on every day so i remember his name i can't say any of their names due to right. HIPAA yeah. rights and policies because they're they're entitled to their privacy definitely as well. absolutely that's part of that human decency piece yes. is they they deserve that um that as well um in um uh, so, so I guess I am. I was really surprised to hear that there's a hundred people that are housed at the facility. How many staff are on site then? Uh, two at a time. Just two. Yes. For a hundred residents. Just about. There, most of them are, I guess, what I would consider low level. They're, you know, not a serious danger. Mm -hmm. I don't. It's it's not. So you think of it this way: like in jail, like people, there's a lot more violence i feel that i've heard happens in jail versus prison because prison people know where they're gonna go mm -hmm. they know there's certainty yes there's yeah. there's this like okay this you're not is waiting for at. the result of your court case and you're not you're not looking yeah. at you know either six months or 10 years you know that's right. a lot of uncertainty as right. to at least what you know if you're comes doing 10 next. years you're doing 10 years and our might as well get comfortable mm -hmm. so like for them what i've noticed is because I haven't worked at any shelters yet where it's just, just, you know, you come in at a certain time and then you stay the night and then you have to leave at a certain time. It's it's not permanent housing. It's just a shelter. It's just a place where you can be safe. Um, this is long-term housing. They're comfortable. That's their home. That is where they rest their head every night. That's where they, you know, go to the bathroom. That's where they eat. That's where they socialize. That's where they smoke their... Like, that's where mm -hmm. they live, you know? And so... I'm curious too. Like you, you did allude to also like there's a variance as to how residents end up in a facility like mm -hmm. this or end up, you know. I mean, everyone is has a kind of a different road into addiction and how they become addicted. But take me through like uh, like a prime example to you as to how someone might end up from whatever situation they're in to being in one of the, one of these facilities. Um, I've noticed some guys are vets. 
that they were in the army at one point and things kind of went just kind of went wrong you know they self-medicated to the point where they just couldn't take care of themselves anymore and they got their terrible alcoholism what i've seen more often than not is divorce and the wives taking everything and they end up on the street damn and so um i have noticed too that there i feel like there is some uh there is some mental health issues that really go into it like some of them just not being able to they're not like I'm not trying to say that they're different. It's just they have a different set of m- mental challenges than you and I would. Mm-hmm. A, a certain awareness that maybe you and I have that they don't. Okay. You know? Isn't that, isn't that interesting as to just like perspective and, mm-hmm. and like you said, mental challenges? Like yeah. we all are looking at the world through different lenses mm-hmm. and there's there's a spectrum to that. And like some people are like wide open. They see the world and all of it's like beauty and, and you know realness and you know whatever yeah. and then there's like a, a narrowed perspective of the world that is is real limiting in a lot of mm-hmm. situations but then even in between there's a just a wide variety of like how do we even know that we look at the color blue and see the same color you know it's right we just agree that the blue that we perceive is blue but it doesn't mean that it looks the same to me as it looks to both of you right right the, the level of uh, personal responsibility, too, I feel like sometimes gets missed. And it does, I'm not faulting them for it. Sometimes I'm oblivious to my own actions and how it affects other people. But I feel like I'm actively trying to, to take a look at that every single day and every single thing that I do. Even when I feel I've been wronged, okay, how did I react to that situation? Was it in a way that aligns with myself? Like, is it in a way that aligns with how I truly am as a person? And uh, sometimes I, I I see some people not taking personal responsibility and everything is about me, 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 me. And they, they're really honed in and focused in on I need to feel good. I need to feel this. And I'm not feeling it right now. And I can't possibly be at fault for me not feeling good. So you're at fault. Mm-hmm. Like the, I, I get that a lot. And it's, it's really hard to try to navigate and talk somebody out of that um, or to at least like, try to get them to see like hey like what can you do that's going to make your situation better because you have the power i believe you have the power and i believe you're smart enough and strong enough to guide yourself in a different direction Mm -hmm. so i try to be as encouraging as i possibly can without telling someone you should do this you know because they're grown men they're in their 50s they're not gonna listen to someone who's 25 for my (laughs) recovery personally Mm -hmm. that was like something i absolutely needed was someone like restoring confidence in me mm-hmm. that was coming from outside myself, right? I need, needed someone to tell me they believed in me that I could pull through. I was strong enough to do this yeah. for it to be like, Oh yeah, I am strong enough to do this. Mm-hmm. You know, it was, it, like it, it all of a sudden like light bulb moment. Yep. And it, that was kind of when my life turned to started to turn around. Um, and it, what it's fascinating to me too, because I think, I don't know exactly how to draw the line, but there's a, a line I think between this conversation and like the conversation that we're going to get into with you, Jason, and in a line between just like recovery, harm reduction Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, regenerative agriculture, right? To me, it it feels like the solutions to those problems are somewhat in the same realm of thinking. Well, yeah, we are what we eat, you know, Mm -hmm. like, and if we're eating like garbage, we're going to feel like garbage, Mm -hmm. you know, and most people don't, really look too deeply into what they're eating you know and i i know i probably should i'm not the person to talk about it my dad is that's why yeah i still eat like you're, you're juicing now so, so <laughs> it's I'm a so step proud of you i try you're, i you're, try uh, at least some of my mojo is running into yes. you a little bit like <laughs> i'm resonating with you a little bit more than i was in the past so yeah that's, that's good to see that my health um stuff is trickling down to you so Yay. Kudos to you. <laughs> uh, so as listeners will know, we only have two microphones today. If you can count, we got three people. Um, let's let's pass that over to Jason just for a little bit. And your Fortnite pin, your Fortnite sticker that I'm just seeing fresh, f- fresh from, from the birthday party, the right? nine year old birthday party. <laughs> I wish I was at the party. Where was my invite? Oh, man. I, I knew you had to get ready for this podcast, so <laughs> yeah. I was going to let you do your thing. I'm just kidding. Next, uh, 
Presley's birthday is in a, a, a month, so you're more than welcome to come to that one. Groovy. Seven year old daughter. So I, yeah. I and you're right. I I was getting ready for this. You know, I I've been thinking a lot about this conversation leading up to it. You had me watch um that documentary, Kiss the Ground. Sweet. Um, you you sent me that podcast also. I'll be honest, I didn't get a chance to, to tune yeah. into I'm it. Just, I know I'm just sending you stuff left. And yeah, right which like, which is really here's what I'm interested in. Here you go. Check this out. It's super useful. Show. It's super useful. And I, if anything, I appreciate it because it makes my job kind of preparing to, to for the conversation right. a lot easier because I can understand your perspective quite a bit more when I see the places that you're getting some of that information from. Right, right. Um, one of the things that we talked about before we started recording was that, uh, you know, when I was spending 15 hours a day playing video games over, over the coronavirus lockdown, you were spending a lot of your time reading. I'm reading books like Glyphosate Free by uh, Kate Birch. <laughs> what, so, yeah. Take me through that. What is some of the the reading and, and some of the the um, you know educate self personal education that you've been doing for yourself? I guess in that time. Yeah. So <laughs> that was a weird I, way I to phrase that question. I guess I'll just start by giving you a little bit of background on my health. Like, okay. So I'm I'm 45 now. Um, in my early 20s, I had some really really severe problems with my health, and Rhea was like five or six at the time. Um, my health. I had uh, what's called ulcerative colitis which is a, a, a gastrointestinal disorder where your colon starts to reject itself or your body starts to reject your colon. And so my large intestine started to pretty much disintegrate inside my body. Mm. And the doctors couldn't do anything about it. I was under all kinds of like anti-organ rejection medicine that they give like kidney transplant people. So they were throwing every med that they possibly could under the sun at me. And this is at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. So it's like I had the best doctors. But, I was in the best possible... How old were you? 24 25 yeah exactly your age right now so that's kind of weird but yeah Mm -hmm. like but you were you know you know five at the time or i was in first grade yeah right yeah so you were really young and anyways like this is like i up until then i was pretty much i eat anything i was like taco bell like fast food was just like oh in the morning i'm gonna go to bk and get you know a sausage croissant and you know i pounded that stuff and i felt great the next day so i thought you know what this isn't, it's not bad. You know, like people are, you know, on the health kick, you know, who cares? You know, like I didn't really put too much thought into it. Um, but once my health started declining, uh, I realized, shit, maybe I'm doing something to contribute to it. But you know what? My doctor said, no, this isn't have anything to do with what you eat. This is just genetic. And you've just hit, you know, got the short end of the stick. Mm. And at the time I was just like, okay, I guess that sucks, but you know, whatever. Uh, anyways we do that a lot we just fall into kind of it's like it's kind of a trap you know yeah. we just we just take what the doctor says as as it right and right. it's like you figure they spent so much time in medical school they know their shit you know like right. who am i to question that and at, that at the time that was my philosophy and so I, I ran with that and just you know finally i was in the i was in the mayo clinic for like a year off and on and finally they just said we have to take out your colon you can't you're it's gonna fall apart you're gonna die basically so i was like uh but don't i need my colon how do i poop then you know right. like that's my first thought right yeah. so that's what most people's first thought is like what are you gonna do without a colon dude you need that to kind of uh get the stuff from your stomach to the to the exit point and so let, let's give it some context really quick let, right. so what exactly does the colon do i know it it helps process bowel movements and stool right but like right. how what's it doing so the majority of the colon's job is for um to absorb the water and stuff and the nutrients out of your you know intestines into the your, like, bloodstream so it helps with hydration i get super dehydrated so like even talking now i i <laughs> am getting dehydrated as i talk so that's a main factor of you know what the large intestines does and it protects your body from like the toxins that are in your system and you know as the food is passing through you you know it 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 absorbs like the nutrients and like keeps the toxins out so it's like a filtration system right right. that's what the colon is doing or the the final filtration system of the okay of the whole system it's what makes our poop solid yeah so like i don't poop solid anymore like that's a you know i don't know pretty graphic but like yeah, so did you end up you ended up getting your colon removed then? i did yeah damn yep so colonless jason i i have no colon <laughs> i have um uh, no colon but still rolling is what we call it in the, <laughs> the community of uh colonless. people with yeah with the ulcerative colitis and so for a few months i had like my small intestines through cut through a hole in my stomach which is called ileostomy mm. and so i had to have a bag 
for like the first five or six months. I don't know if you remember that I at all. That. Yeah, so it's pretty. I showed you. I was like, <laughs> check this out. I got my small intestines and poops coming out into this bag. So <laughs> it was pretty trippy. And how uh, does that feel? I've weird. wondered that. I've it's wondered weird because so I it. it I have like a hole cut in my stomach and the small intestines kind of it's it, it, there's like sutures around it. So as the small intestines is kind of it moves and it's like a muscle that is like flexing to get the stuff through. So you don't you feel that in your stomach, mm -hmm. but I have felt it like on the outside. Exterior. So I can feel my skin opening and closing every time something went through there. And, you know, when we poop, we feel that urge to, you know, go, but mm -hmm. it was constantly coming out. I had no control. That was, that like, was the main thing I was curious about. Do you, do you have that urge? You don't have that urge to poop then. It just is filling up your bag, essentially, right. without you're not sitting down to take a dump, which yep. might be kind of nice, but right. a, it, a silver it lining. It tickled in a way because it was like, <laughs> ooh, that feels weird. And I'd have gas, so every time, you know, instead of farting, it, my my bag would just get bigger and bigger. <laughs> oh, wow. With gas, so it was pretty wow. trippy. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, so I had that going for a while. And um, after, like, a few months, they said, well, we can try to reverse it and hook your small intestines up back down to the exit point. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And um, or you can keep the bag. So they gave me a choice. Basically, you know, they said, you know, you keep the bag if you want or we can give you what's called a J pouch is where they take your small intestines and they kind of loop it and make it like a little J and they suture it together and then they filter it down to the anus. And, okay. You know, so that's what I have right now is a J pouch, which basically mimics the function of a lot large intestines. Now, you know, that little J shape, you mm -hmm. know, most people have like six feet of colon. You know, I have like that much at the end. So it's kind of like the reservoir where, you know, I don't eat something and it's stored there until I have to go. And I still end up going like five or six times a day. But really? Like, so yeah. do, you, do you, I know it sounds kind of gross. And no, I, it's, I appreciate part of your, anatomy. your no, openness to, no, you to have talk to be. about this it. Is yeah. Part of, you know, like my journey. So, so do like, you, whatever. do you have the urge to poop back then? Yeah. Oh, okay. absolutely. So, so you, the, ur to, the urgency is what they call it. And when you have to go, you know, you have nerve endings that are down that connect to you the end of your large intestines that most people usually have. Mm -hmm. But they took those nerve endings and connected it to that J pouch that I just described. So okay. they basically, you know, restored, right, restored my 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 GI tract to kind of mimic the function that a normal person would have. And for the most part, you know, I've been fine for the past 20 years. I just have to go a lot more than normal people. So. Okay. So, okay. So take me further then. When in your experience, um, um, having your colon removed with, what was it called? You, what was it? What was the ailment? Ulcerative colitis. Uh, ulcerative yeah. colitis. It's an autoimmune disorder where your immune system starts to over, it's overexpressed. Your, your immunity is really high and your immune system starts to just basically attack different parts of the body so after having that procedure getting your colon removed how did that lead you to thinking about the food that you were consuming then actually at the time i the doctors were still telling me that what it didn't so um for the next 10 years or so i took that philosophy this i i asked i even asked you know what once i got out of the hospital and i had this new colon you know j pouch and i was going a lot of times as like is, is should i change what i eat and they're like well if you don't if something bothers you don't eat it Mm -hmm. So that's the philosophy I was like, you know, and so I didn't even question it really. It was just like, so my diet, I was still eating, you know, fast food. I was still going to taking the kids to pizza ranch, you know, every week, you know, we mm -hmm. did, you know, go to the kids eat free at pizza ranch. You on look Tuesday. like a pizza ranch dad. Dude, I love, pizza. <laughs> I love the shit out of pizza ranch. I, their pizza and their chicken is, is amazing. And I was all about it. And I really didn't, uh, you know, care that much. I thought, cause my doctors told me it wasn't a big deal. Mm -hmm. So I, I bought that. I bought that, that was not impacting that. I was just, you know, genetically unlucky and that I, so I didn't really even start looking at my diet until like really the past five years. Honestly. So did they, did they, and through that experience, didn't, when they were diagnosing you and figuring out your treatment and all, all that, did they ask you what your diet consisted of? before they came to that determination or they were just like no wasn't this is even genetic a question. really they didn't it was it wasn't i wasn't even asked that at all they just said oh if this bothers you don't eat it so that was pretty much the extent of it mm -hmm. and it, i you it would kept think going they'd at genetics. least be curious as to what you consume right to but but i think there there's also um like somewhat a misconception too, where like doctors aren't nutritionists. They, they have no. very limited and minimal nutrition 
training or, or research or education, right? Almost none. The, the typical MD, and I've researched this, the typical MD program for being a doctor, you need less than 40 hours of nutritional training hmm. to get your MD. And because they, they aren't trained to be nutritionists, there's like nutritionists with a special job. So they figure, okay, if we have a nutritional issue, we'll you know, bring in a nutrition, nutritionist. And so there's that problem where they, they, they aren't trained to, to be preventative when it comes to health. They're, they're, they're experts in reactionary medicine and drug interactions and how we take a drug and it impacts our physiology. So to give you an example, the drugs that they were prescribing me for my ulcerative colitis, they're called uh, TNF blockers and biologics. And what those are, are those, those are artificial antibodies that help regulate the immune system. So I'm taking antibodies, antibodies that are, are supposed to, my body's supposed to be generating them on an, you know, an even level so they you know, stop my immune system from attacking itself and that's what they're supposed to do. But these drugs weren't, you know, they, they, when they, they give them to you, they, um, they, don't, they, they work right away, but then they, they don't allow your body to express its natural, you know, what the body's supposed to be doing. Mm-hmm. And so... They limit you a bit because they're like, they're mimicking what your body is supposed to do. Yeah, they're mimicking what your body is supposed to be naturally doing. And the, the, their, their idea is that, well, your body just isn't working right. So let's give you the drug to make it work right. So Mm. it's reactionary in that way. It's, that's the typical Western model. I, I, I have, I haven't heard that term, but that's exactly how I describe like my issue that I have with like the current, the conventional like pharmaceutical industry is like where we provide treatments to treat symptoms and then like when you're you know a lot of times if that that treatment has another side effect we just provide another treatment to deal with the symptom or side effect of the other treatment and for like there's people in nursing homes and in um, some of these facilities that are like being completely almost taken advantage of because the the industry is making a shit ton of money off of prescribing them you know 10 to 20 or even more treatments in a day And, and a lot of times from just the, from the little bits and pieces that I've seen of people that have that experience, it seems like the treatments, like I said, are just treating side effects of the other treatments that they're on. Yep. Um, so then you, 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 you said that, so over the past, it hasn't been up until like the past five years that you've really been thinking about um, the food that you've been consuming. Yeah. So start to bring us through some of that. What, 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 um, what led you there initially? When, what was it, I guess, that was a catalyst to, to get you to, you know, not take the doctor's advice anymore and be like, all right, let me look at this myself. Right. Okay. So 10 years ago, I'll take you that far back to give you some context. Um, they diagnosed me with another autoimmune disorder called, um, ankylosing spondylitis, which is a form of rheumatoid arthritis. So the symptoms I was having is my, my feet were swelling up. My ankles were really sore and swelling up my knees my shoulders, my neck, all of the areas where you have, I have joints, um, they were getting inflamed. So anytime you have that symptomology, doctors will, you know, look in their little book and they'll say, okay, now you have this disorder you have. Now your joints are swelling up instead of ulcerative colitis. Now you have another autoimmune disorder and they, you know, based on the symptoms, they give it a name. So the name I got was ankylosing spondylitis. And I was like, man, why did I, you know, I, am I just that unlucky doctors? You know, what, what's going on with me? They're like, yep, it's just genetics. There's nothing you can do about it. It's just the fact that you had one autoimmune disorder, your body, it just, your autoimmune system is just fucked basically. Mm. That's basically the reasoning they gave me. And they started giving me the same medications they were giving me back 20 years ago called Humira, which is a TNF blocker I was talking about. That's and one I've seen on on commercials, you see, yeah, right? You'll see the Humira. It, it's is a it pen used, injection, and you uh, is it used yourself? as a treatment for like um, like neuropathy? It can. I think it I can feel like be. That's where I've seen for, it. Um, I don't think Humira specifically, but there are different ones that are in the same class because you can have autoimmune disorders that infect impact you know neurologically and mm. different issues with that. So once they started prescribing me the same medicines, I was like. You guys were giving me this 20 years ago or 10 years ago when I had, you know, getting my colon removed and I ended up going, you know, having a, a piece of my anatomy ripped out because it didn't work. And I was like, how is it going to work this time? They're like, well, we don't know if it's going to work or not. You know, you should take it and try it. And I, I just it just got me to thinking like, shit, you know, 
there's something else that's I'm there's a piece of the puzzle I'm missing basically and so um, once I started prescribing the same medications and I, I was taking it I took it initially and it helped it helped reduce the symptoms my my swelling went down my pain went down so I'm like but okay. that's what it's doing though is treating the symptom it's right? treating the symptom and so like I did that for like five years off and on like I still didn't like to take it but at the same time they were also, I mean, I'll just be real. They were giving me Vicodin as much as I wanted, basically. Mm. I went, they said, you go to the pain clinic, and I could write my own prescription. So I was, I was taking like 120 to 150 a month of Vicodin. Damn. And they, that's and, a straight-up opiate addiction. Oh, yeah. I, that's that's kind of what led me and Rhea to go or me to want to go to Peru to, to do ayahuasca because – I couldn't control myself. I had no, I, I was an addict, you know, and, and I, and I didn't know, I didn't, I knew I didn't want to take that for the rest of my life, but I had, I had it to take it to function. So that was my idea of why I, you know, I was going to, cause I heard ayahuasca was, you know, and, and I'd been familiar with psychedelics, mm -hmm. but I heard like ayahuasca really gets in there and really helps you start to tackle some of this. I was like, that's for me. And then Rhea, you know, she was going through the stuff with heroin at the time. So I thought, oh, God, well, I should probably take her with me. Because originally, I just planned to go by myself. And so that's kind of what led that into yeah. that. And Real quick, before I lose the thought, I'm yeah. thinking about how I, in part, I feel like I would like, you, you know, my initial reaction to like the way the doctors were wanting to treat your two auto, autoimmune disorders and having like the same treatment for two different illnesses is like, it sounds lazy at like, at yeah. first look at it, right? It's a shot in the dark. It, it sounds lazy, but... It, they almost are like the, the victims in that, right? They're like that's just the way that they were trained. So it's more like the, the, the institutions and like the universities and the systems that are producing our doctors that's, you know, at fault here as opposed to the doctors that, you know, that's just all they know. Um, that's exactly it. And just we were talking before we went, you know, live about, you know, the history behind some of the, way, the reasons why that is. And so it all, it goes back to the mid 1800s uh, about, you know, there was two doctors basically that had two different philosophies. One was Louis Pasteur and then one was Antoine Bechamp. And so you had these two doctors that were basically the fathers of modern medicine. Um, I think around the late 1800s, mid 1800s around there. And around that time, you know, they were just starting to figure out, you know, what, okay, how do we start, you know, making medicine models to, to treat people? So there was all kind of, you know, people that were selling snake oils and all kinds of, you know, different things back then. It's like, this is the miracle cure. Here you go. Here's a potion for you to take. Mm -hmm. And so these two doctors, they were kind of getting in the mainstream with the people that had control over the, the medical policies back then, which is like the, the American Medical Association, which started around the same time. So they were trying to get doctors in here to kind of figure out, okay, what, what models of medicine are we going to use going forward? And so Louis Pasteur, as we were talking about, kind of won that battle over Antoine Bechamp kind of saying that pasteurization and the way to, to avoid disease is to sterilize. It's to sterilize everything. And, it, and if anybody wants to look it up, it's called germ theory versus terrain theory, which is the idea that, you know, in the idea that if you have an issue with somebody, you treat the person itself or you treat the, the terrain that it's in. So the picture you'll get if you Google terrain theory online is uh, two fish Two, uh, two goldfish, one in a fish tank next to each other and two identical ones. And one of, one of the fish tanks is uh, the germ theory. The fish tank is dirty. And it's like, okay, if, if a fish is sick, are you going to take them out of the fish tank or are you going to inject the fish with something? It's like you change the dirty water that's in the fish tank. So that's mm. the terrain that, that Antoine Bachamp was kind of like, hey, guys, yeah, you can fix the you can fix the goldfish itself, but let's look at the terrain the fi this fish is swimming in. It sounds like modern medicine is like rooted in like the easy way out and like the shortcut and the simplest answer. Yeah. And and the what's the guy's name with the terrain theory guy? What's his name? Uh, Antoine Bachamp. Antoine Bachamp. Yep. And yeah. it sounds like Bechamp. there was probably a large lack of understanding of what he was really trying to get at with his terrain theory. You know, yep. germ theory seems like with the technology and, and the, the facts that would have been available to them at that point in time, it's like, well, the person's getting better, right? Like by yeah. through this treatment. So, of course, this is the right way to do it. Right. And it just kind of stops right there. Yep. Um, 
Um, and it's not like it's right or wrong. Of course, you, if someone's, something's wrong with you, of course, you got to get treated for mm-hmm. what's wrong with you. But the idea is why, why, why not be proactive in preventing something from occurring to begin with? And that's the whole idea behind terrain theory. It's like you fix the terrain that you're in, you're going to be less susceptible to being affected by pathogens, by viruses, mm-hmm. by the things that are in your environment. That, I think that's why with you know COVID, I don't know if you want to talk about that a little bit, but that's I think that's a reason why you see so many young people not being affected by COVID versus a lot of old people is because as you age, your terrain gets worse and worse. Your, gold, your, your fish tank gets dirtier and dirtier. Your cells start to degrade. And so your terrain isn't able to, to fight off some of these things. Mm-hmm. And so it, it's, you know, and I'm sure young fe- people are affected too, but it's, you look at the stats, it's like overwhelming that the elderly are being affected. And it's not just because they're old, it's because their terrain it, over time degrades. Mm-hmm. And, and it especially know. degrades with the conventional ways of life that, yeah. um, take me through some of those then through, well, hold on, maybe I'm getting too far off. Yeah, we can go a lot of different directions. We, we, had, we like, can go you a lot know, of different like, directions. This all connects together, and it's like, uh, I feel like that, that meme, that, uh, that Charlie meme is like pointing at all these, you know, like, <laughs> oh, yeah. This is me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I mean, because what I mean, what's fascinating is, and, and kind of fun, is kind of like I was saying before, like what we were talking about with Rhea, there, there's still, there's like a line to be drawn between the two conversations, and like it, it does connect in, in a lot of different ways. Um, so, so let's see so i'm trying to trying to think of like where were we when we kind of went on that tangent yeah i don't know man well, cause we, were, we were talking <laughs> like about my health and like what uh, made you aware of like essentially you okay know, the so idea of you basically are i got tired of listening to the doctors because each doctor i didn't feel like i was getting the whole story and honestly to be honest i, I i'm a computer programmer that's what i've done that's what i got my degree in i, I have my degree in computer information systems and so my mind works, I, I, you know, everything's technology, you know, like that's been my research area of research for the past 20 years up until five years ago when I realized maybe there's something else I should, should know about, especially since my health is degrading to such a large degree. I better understand how my body works so I can start to have these, at least have a discussion with a doctor to be able to say, okay, you just told me that and you said a lot of large, fancy words. Mm-hmm. You know, what does that, I can understand. You want to so, understand. I want to understand what those words mean and not just like, uh-huh, okay, doctor, you, you got it. Okay, give me the drug. Okay, I'm better. Fine. Mm-hmm. I want to understand what's happening in my body when I take the drug and why I'm taking the drug and what's it, what, what it's doing. And then that's, you know, that's kind of what I started looking to all this stuff and making it a, a concern of mine because of my own, just out of sheer like need mm-hmm. to understand how my body works and how all the things that the drugs I'm taking, you know, the food, everything around me, you know, was affecting me. Mm-hmm. So go, so now, now you, you feel empowered to want to take your health into your own hands and, 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 understanding some of the things we've kind of alluded to. So what, what does that look like in the offset? Like, where do you look first? Right. So when I first started looking into this stuff, I used Google, right? <laughs> like, so I went on Google and be like, okay, uh, natural first I was looking at like natural, you know, health remedies, like herbal remedies and stuff. So that's kind of where I started my, my journey just by Googling and looking what other people are doing. Mm-hmm. And so once I started opening that book, uh, I realized that, you know, a lot of people are healed. There was two, that's when I realized the Antoine Bechamp, Louis Pasteur type of method. There was two different philosophies, basically, people were using on how to treat themselves, either treat the symptoms or address the issues. And so that, then I said, okay, what are all the potential ways I can improve my terrain? You know, food, water, um, environment, the things that I'm being subjected to. Um, so that's when I started looking at things like food and realizing, Hmm, maybe all the health experts are right. And that, you know, what you're putting in your body is actually impacting more than just, you know, what the doctors were telling me that, Oh, you just have bad genetics. Mm -hmm. So then I started looking at food and, and, and really the just, you know, I, my diet before then was pretty much meat and potatoes, like vegetables and fruit. Nah, every once in a while. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. So I like my, my pizza ranch, deep fried broached, uh, whatever, the, the deep fried chicken. 
and pizza. I love pizza, man. Pizza is like my favorite food ever. I mean, talking about pizza <laughs> consistently makes me want pizza. Right. I, absolutely. I think there's no other food that when I talk about it, I want it immediately. <laughs> That's just it. And uh, I was that way for a long time until I realized that, you know, I had just turned 40 and I, and I kind of like looked at my future and like looked at 50 year olds and 60 year olds and 70 year olds. And I see, I saw a lot of different people in that age group that were just, you know, their health was obviously awful. And then you see some that, you know, their health was pretty good. And you kind of wonder, you know, how are these people so different? You know, mm -hmm. how are, how, what, what's the different, what's the common factor that's creating these unhealthy people with osteoporosis that are hunched over and, you know, all kinds of medical issues moving slow. And there's out other people that are just jogging in their seventies and eighties. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? What's the difference? And then yeah. obviously you have to look at, you know, there's genetics. It's genetics is, is some factor. It's gotta be some factor, but it's obviously there's something else that those other people are doing mm -hmm. that, that the other so ones a lot of times that. genetics, like the genetics, like rationale feels like an excuse. It is. It's like, like, Oh, you know, my family's fat, so of course I'm going to be fat. And it's like, yeah, it, that did. could be true. You know, maybe you have like, um, is it like hyperthyroidism yeah. that runs in your family? That's, right. you know, there's... I just big boned or... Yeah, you know, like... I mean, like, to some degree <laughs> that could be true. But are you doing everything in your power to not be fat and unhealthy, right? And it's right. like, if you want to be fat, like, go ahead, be fat. But... Don't like complain about it and just make excuses as to why you're fat while you're complaining about it. Please and thank you. Yeah, genetics runs in families, but also recipes run in families. In like your old grandma's recipe for biscuits, I mean that's going to get passed down. And yeah, and just that, habits, that, right? Right, just habits. Yeah, and, you're, you're, and what's normal? Yeah, what you consume, what channel of news you watch. Uh, yeah, what, and, that, and that's another thing too. I think about that, like that I've heard talked about in some of the other like intellectual circles that I try to tune into, but about like, besides being like, you are what you eat, but you're also like the information that you absorb too. Yeah. Like what, what type of things are you feeding your mind? Right. If you're feeding your mind bullshit, that's all you're going to be thinking about. It's kind of that same thing. If you're eating a bunch of bullshit, your physical health is going to be shit. Right. Your mind and body are so intricately connected. It's so, so weird to think about everything that you do for your body. Uh, automatically impacts you mentally mm -hmm. and everything you do mentally is going to impact you physically somehow. I mean, it's just, they're finding a lot of physiology that connects those two. I mean, before it's just like, Oh yeah, they're probably connected, but no, they're intricately connected to each other. Part of preparing for this podcast was me going to the gym because I know, I know if I work out hard enough and I get those endorphins kicking, like I'm going to be like, I'm going to feel lighter, less stress, more open, you know, more energetic, you know, just, just there, there definitely does something like when I move my body physically to my mind. Yeah. And I've noticed that too, with like the food I consume too, like as I've been more conscious of trying to consume more wholesome food and being like conscious of the nutrients that my body needs and trying to feed it that, that like mentally I feel, you know, clear, um, more sharp a lot of the time. Um, or like when I play with fasting, a lot of times if I'm fasted for like, uh, uh, it depends, but if I fast for 16 hours, like on the tail end of that 16 hours, sometimes I'm like, I don't even want to eat. Like I feel <laughs> great right now. You know, um, the, the, it is interesting how there is such a connection between the mind and the body. Right. Oh, and, yeah. and, uh, in another podcast I had, I think it was like 10 podcasts ago. A lot of what we talked about was like that there's like like three pillars to self and and some some might say being like your mind body and then your spirit mm -hmm. and part of like the theory that we were talking about was that like you need to like have a strong foundation in your mind and in your body in order to be even in tune with like your spirit i think we were talking about that in our conversation before you go do things yeah they have you do a dieta where you got for a week or two they say they recommend up to three weeks you know no, no meat, no salt, no sugar. You want things as bland as possible to kind of dull your senses, to kind of really tune in. Even to that no spiritual. sex, right? Yeah, no sex. You know, you want to conserve that that energy to use it to you know kind of tune into that other aspect of of, of who we are. Mm -hmm. And and so I didn't really get that at the time, but I, you know, I don't think Rhea even followed Dieta like, and I, and I was and I followed it as much as I could. I didn't eat meat, you know. I had some salt, you know. 
gotta have some fucking yeah. salt. You know, yeah. like you know, you know what you get, that you know, I tried eating bland like zucchini, and I was like, oh, gross. Yeah. But uh, you know, there's a reason behind that because you you your senses kind of tune you into the physical world. You know, they they uh, you know keep you here in this dimension. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. like but if you're dulling your senses, you're allocating more of that subtle energy, that chi energy, into a different aspect of of you know spiritual the spiritual side of uh, when did <laughs> when did you guys go to peru 2016 2016 yeah I think so it was 16 yeah. almost five years ago now yeah was yeah. your was your iowa ayahuasca iowa ayahuasca experience you, you might not experience too much in iowa what was your yeah. ayahuasca experience <laughs> um do you feel like that was in part catalyst to thinking about some of this stuff also like did you feel uh, in, any more inspired on this topic after that experience at all or, or did it not shift at all i would say that is the primary reason why i started making some of these shifts because around 2016 you know it was five years ago when i kind of started looking into that stuff mm-hmm. you know and i was experimenting with psychedelics and you know mushrooms and stuff and so i started to think differently almost around that time so and then the ayahuasca journey has kind of put me over the top just even going to peru and experiencing that different culture and you know us walking through the rainforest and seeing all these little indigenous villages you know people you know little kids running around and just you know realizing wow there's people living an entirely different life and they looked super happy and Mm -hmm. you know and i started that's what kind of planted the seed and literally there was a farm right next to don lucio's uh ayahuasca retreat um and he took us to to go explore the farm they showed us all the regenerative agriculture he was doing out there and you know they didn't have glyphosate out there they didn't have all these chemical inputs that we're using in traditional farming today and their food was amazing they had food growing everywhere naturally in the jungle and I was like, how are they, how is our food not, you know, how do we not have, you know, the same type of food or how are they able to do this without all of these chemicals that we're using in our farming? Mm-hmm. And they just, and he was showing us, and I didn't really understand it at the time, but he was showing us composting and doing different things to generate those natural nutrients in the food. Mm-hmm. So they didn't need chemical inputs. And recycle because, waste, right? Yeah. We, we they, spend so much energy on like our waste, yeah. let alone our farming methods, but like, yeah. um, moving our waste around the, the I, I asked that cause the response you gave me to the question of like, was ayahuasca kind of a catalyst to thinking about this was almost exactly what I was expecting. Right. Yeah. Where like through like my psychedelic experiences and specifically my five MEO DMT, um, experiences were like, got me more in tune to that thought, like that, that solidarity and that oneness and that unity with not only the people around me, but the earth also yep. and, and mother earth and Gaia and whatever, um, you want to refer to it as, and just being in tune with that. And, and to me, it was putting myself in your shoes and having that ayahuasca experience, I can imagine maybe experiencing something similar and that, you know, f- having that experience would just for me, it definitely forced me to think about the way I interact with the, the world around me um, differently. So I imagine like exactly like you described it. Being yeah. It changed my life impactful. because like literally when I got back, I felt like I was so out of place. Like most people that have psychedelics journeys, they like you come back and you know, uh, you're kind of like, fuck man, mm-hmm. what am I going to do now? Like I just experienced yeah. this profound journey in the middle of the rainforest. And like, literally I can't talk to anybody else. Cause I don't have anybody else who knows other than Rhea. Like, you know, we went through that experience and you can talk to other people that have had psychedelic experience. But most people, you know, honestly use them to party with and mm-hmm. not to like, do self-reflection in a way that they plan on doing something about it Mm -hmm. and me i i was in that space where i knew i needed to make a change i just didn't know what or how or what direction i was going to go but that was a catalyst for that that was a Mm -hmm. huge catalyst so when i came back i was on a mission at then i was like i'm gonna fucking change i'm gonna do something to change what i'm doing how i'm interacting with the rest of the world i don't know how i'm gonna do it but I'm going to do it. And mm-hmm. so I started, you know, I started getting into meditation after that and realizing I need to like start tuning in, you know, to myself and, you know, take care of my diet, take care of me mentally. Cause I, mentally I was fucked up too, because I was like on Vicodin at the time still. Mm-hmm. And you know, when I, when after the ayahuasca journey, I stopped doing the Vicodin. I was just Hell like, yeah. you know what? I, I'm done with it. Yeah. And nice. Rhea, Rhea was clean off heroin. So I was like, that's amazing. Like what kind of cat, 
ayahuasca will not cure you from an opiate addiction. Mm -hmm. It will give you the mental capacity to give you the drive to know what you need to do to move in that direction. Mm -hmm. And And, you can, you can take the ball and run with it or you can drop the ball. Right. It kind of like breaks the chains, but like, like kind of like you described it, it, you come back and you feel like kind of out of place when you get back. Right. (laughs) It's like it breaks the chain for you, but you're still holding on to the chain and you have like the conscious decision. Like, I don't know, (laughs) am I just going to cozy up and reconnect this chain and let myself be chained down? Or am I going to take this, this now that I have the, um, you know, the openness or, or the ability I've been empowered with the ability to choose other than being tied down. Right. Which way am I going to go? And, and that's it. That's a, a, a tough point in time. Sometimes when I, the it last time I, the last time I came out of my five MEO DMT experience, I considered not talking. I was like, I'm going to take a vow of silence. And it was like, I ended up not obviously I'm talking right now, right, right. but, but it was, it was interesting. Cause like p- that part of my decision coming back was like, if I choose not to talk, maybe I can stay connected with, with that place that, that I place, just was yeah. right. Um, yeah, it's just, so re- it's kind of really like what I was talking about the diet, uh, the, the dulling of the senses, you were trying to dull out, you know, the external senses of thought is a sense and ego, e- yeah, and specifically ego. ego. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's, I think that it's just the natural drive to want to get back to that space where you're not used constantly in your head or in your ego. Anytime you want to achieve something, it's the ego trying to do it. It's not you. It's like when stuff's coming from your heart, you can tell when someone is like heart centered versus like trying to be manipulative. And Mm -hmm. so I can see how you'd like want to do. I've considered it too. Like I, and I've done that. I've got not like a whole vow of silence, but I spent like 24 hours in my room with nothing, no gadgets, just sitting and meditating and just like no distractions just to get that hard. It was, it was incredibly difficult because I was like, oh, my God, what if Rhea needs me for something? What if mm-hmm. my, one of my kids needs something? So we're so connected to the world around us, and we want to you know, be online and be in social media because we feel like that that's responsible and we should do that. That's interesting. But we need to have that, that own self-break to kind of recenter ourselves and you know, give ourselves kind of that catalyst to kind of just you know, not be so – immersed in whatever's going on around us, but tuning into that own intuitive knowledge that we all have, that you can get into that space with psychedelics, but that space you can also get into, you know, using meditative techniques, using deep breathing, you know, diaphragmatic breathing. I don't mm-hmm. know if you ever I've, tried that. Yeah, I've, it's, tr- it's I've literally tripped in sitting in the sauna through breathing exercises that brought yeah. me straight to that same place as like 5-MeO DMT. Maybe not as intensely, but no. I definitely had had similar experience where I saw that violet flame and I was there. I had that yeah. that sensation of, of solidarity and oneness with the world around me and, and shedding my physical vessel, you know, without any use of psychedelics. I've had that experience without psychedelics too, yeah. which to me is the most compelling part because psychedelics are like a shortcut to get there, but it, it's achievable without them too. And it's like, to me, that's just like, you know, because sometimes you think about like 5-MeO DMT, like is my experience real, authentic, or is it just drug induced? Like, is am I hallucinating? Right. right? And it's like, now I feel like I know, no, I'm not just hallucinating because I've had that experience being in that same exact place and that same exact space um, without any use of drugs too. Yeah. Yeah. So I know you've spent a lot of time really researching this and, and putting a lot of thought behind this. So I want, I do want to allow you to also take us through some of like the facts of, of, um, you know, one, the, the impact that our conventional farming methods have on our health and on our environment. And then also like the, some of the solutions that can be, you know, that we can come up with through thinking about regenerative farming, the need for it. Um, maybe even kind of like in Kiss the Ground, they talked a lot about like desert, des- desertification mm-hmm. and um, how we're, you know, I think I alluded to before, maybe before we hit record, but how we're like our conventional methods are like parasitic, right? And we're just yeah. like sucking the life out of earth where with regenerative farming, like in reality, there's enough if we if the systems are thought out well enough, like there's enough to for for it all to, you know prosper and be self-sufficient and all these things. So I guess I don't know where to start with that, but take me yeah, through some of it. I mean, 
If you're watching this right now, pause the video and then go to Netflix and watch Kiss the Ground. So, or also a lot of this is probably not, it's going to make sense, but it's going to put it in the right context if Mm -hmm. someone has that background. Just because that it's a documentary, it's like an hour and a half long. It kind of sums up the whole thing that you were talking about with regenerative farming and the impacts it's having on our, you know, our health and on a global level, on, on a climate change level. And so Kiss the Ground, Netflix, is uh, probably essential watching, I think, for everybody, really. Even if you're not a farmer, even if you're not being impacted by it, I mean, we all, we all eat food. We all go to the store and buy food. And the, the lineage behind how that food gets there, how it's grown, um, you know, how it's packaged, how it's sent to the store, and all of the resources that have to go into that entire process – Kiss the Ground is probably the best documentary out there that explains a, a small fraction of it. Not even that's it's just like a general overview. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's so much you could talk about when it comes to that. But so I guess as we get into it, sorry to cut yeah. you off because no, I know absolutely. I like asked you to talk and yeah, now yeah, I'm yeah, talking yeah. again. No, but I, I one thing I just thought of right there was how we were talking about like germ theory and terrain theory and how like germ theory right. is kind of reactionary to like the symptom, right? And it's almost like the shortcut and like the almost like the easy way out. In some scenarios, maybe not perfectly, like, but in some scenarios, it's, like, the easy way out. And I think about how, like, conventional farming was, is kind of, like, that same thing. Whereas it was, it was, like, (laughs) it was, it's, it's the easy way out. It's just, like, we know that this works and we can grow the food. And if we just use the pesticides and sterilize everything, our plant's going to come through and, and, you know, yeah, the 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 soil is losing some of its vitality and 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 integrity, but you know we're still producing. You know, and I and yeah, I don't know. I guess I just drew that line in my head right now. But no, now that's I'm, amazing how you made that connection because that, that's that definitely the connection that I've made too, and how things kind of mimic what's going on in our health and what the philosophies that go on in our health kind of transition upward and downstream or upstream, however you want to look at it, into the ways that, you know, our medical models kind of mimic our, our, our agricultural models in a lot of ways. And the conventional farming, you know, I'll just kind of talk a little bit about, you know, how we grow food traditionally. Um, so there's an idea of monoculture, right, where monoculture means you're growing basically one type of crop. So a majority of our crops right now are grown in that style of monoculture where you take a you know, piece of real estate and you're growing one type of crop on it. Corn, soybean, rice, um, wheat are uh, some of the you know, more popular crops. That's how, you know, and those crops are, a lot of them are GMO crops that are genetically modified. And then they're, the reason they're genetically modified is so you can spray them with chemical inputs to limit the weeds around them. Mm-hmm. So those those crops that, you know, the, the weeds that are getting sprayed, so you only have the crop growing, so all the soil, the nutrients in the soil go right into the plant, so you get a healthy piece of corn. If you look at a, pe- a conventional piece of corn versus organic corn, you're not going to be able to tell the difference. But the way it's grown, it's the nutrients in the soil don't get into the plant the same way they do in conventional versus organic farming. And so the main problem with that is that when you do that, you cause something like you were talking about desertification. After a while, you can do that for, you know, and get away with, you know, the monocrop culture and grow fields and fields of corn and not be impacted. But eventually the soil is going to degrade and die down. And when that happens, the soil becomes unfarmable or you have to add chemical inputs to make the soil more fertile so the plants grow. If mm-hmm. you don't, the, the, you plant some corn seeds, they're not going to grow. They're going to be so tiny that, you know, you're not going to get a big piece of corn out of it. You're going to get, like, little corn or deformed corn or whatever. And so that process has been slowly happening as time goes on as we've started to grow food in this country. And it really starts – you have to really understand where it starts – um, as far as when this stuff started happening back in like the mid 1800s, I think it was, um, there was a homestead act. It was like 1862. The homestead act gave people that were, you know, trying to, you know, you know, uh, the government gave people 160 acres to, to start farming. And so a lot of these people that they, they didn't have any experience farming. So they're like, Oh, we're just going to start farming and tilling the land. Mm-hmm. And so when you till the land, you also create more desertification because you're ruining the natural 
um, soil itself, and you're, uh, when you, you till up the land, you start to release some of the carbon that's in the soil and the, the moisture, and so you get dry soil, and you, you don't have that life in the soil that's supposed to be there. Um, naturally, when you don't till the land, we don't have chemical inputs. But back in the in the 1800s, they didn't have chemical inputs, so it was just tilling the land. But eventually, because there wasn't a need for chemical inputs yet, we didn't we no. hadn't we hadn't damaged the soil enough at that point in time right. to need the chemical. No, input. so we got away with it. Basically, we got we got away with farming the way that we traditionally do, and the farming the ways that have been passed on for a long time because the soil, you know, you can get a lot of the nutrients are going to be in the soil for a long time. And so as as time went on though, you they uh in like the 1930s, I believe it was, you had something called the Great Dust Bowl and you I don't know if you um saw that and kiss the ground, but yeah. that was when that was when the land started to dry up basically and the soil was turning from like black soil that was supposed to be into like dry dirt. And so when that happens, the crop started failing. And when the crop started failing, you got things like the Great Depression. It wasn't the main cause of the Great Depression, but it certainly contributed to the lack of food that was available. And so you had that downstream effect where, you know, the over tillage of the soil was causing these issues that caused the, the crops not to major, grow. Major, you know, major impacts on health economy and, yeah. and just way of life at that point in time, too. Yep. And so right around then, too, we started developing science around, okay, how can we fix this problem? So, of course, our, our, our models are, we have a problem, let's add stuff to it, or let's fix what's going on to the actual problem itself. And that's when we started to, the, the German scientist, uh, I forget his name. Haber. Haber, yeah, that uh, they mentioned in Kiss the Ground. Um, develop, started developing nitrogen inputs to get put in the soil so they make it more fertile again. And they're like, okay, great. We got this nitrogen input we can mm -hmm. put in the soil. But Let's talk about that just yeah, for yeah. a second because I thought that was, that was one thing I have listed here just that stood out to me from Kiss the Ground was the, the origin of, of pesticides and the, the nitrogen inputs um, that were developed through the Haber method. method. And, and the fact that some – that that originally was was used as like a a, a weapon right yeah the, what we use as pesticides what has evolved to what we use as pesticides in some of our conventional farming methods was originally used to to gas the jews and then um yeah, and the also Holocaust, it's yeah. also modern tear gas mm -hmm. yeah. I'm, I've, I'm pretty sure someone informed me of that recently that um the same thing the way um that's where tear gas comes from too and pesticides um yeah yeah. Um, you, have you heard of Agent Orange? Right. From yes. Vietnam? That's yes. also the, some of the same company, du, um, DuPont, or I believe, I forget the company, but yeah, I think that, that it's the same company that manufactured uh, the glyphosate and the pesticides that we use now developed, you know, the gas that they use in the gas chambers and Agent Orange to destroy all of the foliage in, in Vietnam so we can eliminate the Viet Cong. It, it destroyed everything. Mm -hmm. And so once the wars were over, we're like, okay, we have all this great stuff that's destroying plants. And you're like, how can we use it? I mean, we're not in war anymore, so how are we going to use it? And so, of course, you know, we come up with uh, a ways, oh, we need to destroy weeds. And, you know, if we have a weeding, you know, weed problem in farming, we can use this stuff to maybe do that. Oh, but that'll kill the actual plant, too. So that's when genetic modification stepped in and be like, okay, well, how can we create a plant that's resistant to this stuff? but kills the weeds. Hmm. And so that's when you get genetic modification and then spraying and you get the combination of those two that eventually lead to more and more degradation of the soil itself, which, you know, the soil needs to be alive to, to be really regenerative. And that's what, you know, the first step of how the, all that unfolded is that, that uh, you know, conventional GMO, you know, pesticide mm -hmm. recycle that we're still in today. and. So take take me through some of the impacts of glyphosate then, on on like besides just killing the weeds, right? And and you know being why we need GMO um, plants. Like what 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 impact is glyphosate having on us physically when we consume those foods? Right. So it doesn't have a, an immediate direct impact. That's how they're supposed to get it. That's how they're they've been able to legalize it because glycine at its core or glyphosate at its core is glycine 
And glycine is an essential amino acid, which we all need because all of our, all of our body is made out of proteins. You know, a lot of our you know joints and our skin and just a lot of our inner organs are all have different proteins in them. A lot of them are have glycine in in, in them as well. But glyphosate is also is, is created from glycine, or glyphosate is created from glycine, which is, has another element added to it. It's called an organophosphate. And so when you have that and you put it in your body, um, it goes through your body and then it, it's, it, it acts as like what's called a metal chelator. And it, inter, inter, interface, it interacts with all the different metals in your body, like iron and copper and all these different things. And once it does that, you, ruin, you, you start to degrade some of the, the stuff that, that your body needs, like the, um, the bacteria in your gut, like the microbes in your gut. It starts to impact that entire process. And glyphosate is also a patent, patented antibiotic, so it sterilizes your gut, basically, and it doesn't allow the body to kick in those natural immune systems, the, the, your natural immune system and all of the other functions of your body to generate proteins is all impacted by glyphosate. Mm -hmm. So you start to get joint pain, you start to get neurological issues because you know, our, without those gut microbes, we, don't, we can't create those natural amino acids that the, the plants are supposed to have. So when- And what, what that our brain needs. Yeah, right? that our brain needs. You know, uh, one of the main thing glyphosate does is it blocks what's called a shikimate pathway in the plants. And the shikimate pathway is supposed to generate tyrosine, tryptophan, and phenylalanine, and all of those are precursors to dopamine and serotonin, mm -hmm. which obviously are the feel-good chemicals. So it's chemicals. like no wonder we're so fucking sad and depressed, right? Mm -hmm. if, we're, if, we, if we're killing the, the, the precursors to the, the feel-good chemicals in our brain, mm -hmm. of course we have a society that's, that is then in need of antidepressants, right, on the, on the long-term effect, too. Glyphosate has been sprayed over the past 30 years, and we've seen such a huge rise in stuff like mental disorders since then, mm -hmm. and that's, that's got to be the why. I mean, 90% of our serotonin is made in our gut. And most people think, oh, serotonin, that's just a brain you know, neurotransmitter. It's like, it, it is, but our gut has, It doesn't just have get a produced out of nowhere. No, right? yeah. You, like we're you saying, like the precursors that are, are coming from our gut are the building blocks to those things in our brain, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so it makes you realize that if you sterilize your gut, you're you're not getting those those natural endogenous neurotransmitters that you're supposed to have to help you feel good. So that that absolutely is a precursor to things like addiction, because if you're not getting it through the natural means that the plants are supposed to give you, mm -hmm. you're going to feel like you need to get it elsewhere. And, mm -hmm. and that's absolutely, I mean, that has to be one of the main reasons. I'm trying to why. run a study now. Like how many, how many, <laughs> how many addicts or former addicts before they were like actively addicted to a substance had a, a, a diet that consisted of just like processed and, you know, um, treated foods, right? Um, like probably a large number of those people intuitively is be. what I think of right away. <laughs> right. And, the, and yeah, yeah. It's it is it is um, somewhat scary to see how when you see it like visually like on a graph that spike of, from about you know the end of the eighties and the beginning of the nineties of like mental health and addiction and cancer rates and all those sorts of things. You think that is can that be directly correlated to glyphosate or is glyphosate? Because I know. I've heard it said like correlation doesn't equal causation, right? Yeah, yeah. So just because they match up on the timeline, can we really say like glyphosate is a, a, a cause or a catalyst to those that spike in numbers? It seems like that. I mean, it's like what else is there? What else has been more prevalent in the past thirty years other than the fact that we start since the mid '90s? Pretty much, glyphosate is the number one chemical in the world that's been sold that's the m more, number one manufactured chemical in the world and so like what else has happened in the past 30 years rap music <laughs> <laughs> rap music is why there's so much cancer could be could be that like you know <laughs> i'm just kidding yeah obviously no. right right that yeah that's kind of was my <laughs> the joke of it um yeah Okay, so where do we go from there with glyphosate? I'm, Man, I, there's a lot of ways you there's can a go. Ton. Like, yeah. So, so my main thing is for like health reasons, it, and not only just for your own health, it's for the health of the soil itself too. And so, you know, you want to 
start to look at different ways where you can avoid, obviously, glyphosate. And it's really hard because it's in everything. It's, it's water soluble. So a lot of the main problems happening when you spray is that it's, it runs, once it rains, it, it'll wash off the plants and run into, you know, whatever water source is nearby, which is, you know, around the Midwest. Mm -hmm. You have the Mississippi River. You have all these tributaries that feed into the Mississippi River. Mm. And so when you have that, you have all of this, these chemicals that are running all the way down, all the way into the Gulf of Mexico, you know, and, in you know, through Louisiana into the Gulf of Mexico. And in that south, in, in the area, in between, like, um, Baton Rouge and Louisiana, you have like an 80 mile stretch of like the highest cancer rates in the world. Like that, that 80 mile stretch really? is, is insane. They call it cancer alley. I mean, they've given it a specific name for that specific stretch at the end of, of the U S where you run into the Gulf of Mexico. And so you start to look at stuff like that and like, wow, like, you know, what, what else could be causing all of this? And then you have the seven, 7,000 square mile stretch in the Gulf of Mexico where there's no fish, no coral, no, no marine life of any sort. It's like, what is there? There's no, it, that just didn't happen. You know, if humans were here, that, that dead zone wouldn't be there. So obviously we caused it. Mm -hmm. And if it isn't glyphosate, you know, what else is it? Mm -hmm. So to me, that is like the number one thing is like, we're killing the marine life we're killing the life in our gut and it's it, it there's there's a correlation there and you, you know there you can't pick up a medical journal right now without research without them mentioning the microbiome and the biome in our gut gut health they, they've seen as a precursor to almost every disease it starts in your gut and like that it's being talked about just about everywhere now so hmm. it's like keeping your gut healthy is is just like foundational and then, so that's a, it's a good point that you just had that it goes to kind of what I was just thinking about how, like, we, we, a lot of times we think of ourselves like separate from like the earth, right? Yeah. Like me as an individual human is separate from, you know, that tree in that forest where that deer exists. Right. When in reality, <laughs> like we're, we're all like one, like earth is like almost like one, like n not currently perfectly balanced but like the i think ideally it would be just like a perfectly balanced like existence right that yeah. we are not we are a part of we are we are one with right that's the name of the podcast uh, right <laughs> but yeah. um we like we we are one with that so there there is like that so if we consider the health of the world that surround us and the terrain that we exist in we ourselves are going to be healthier and stronger as individuals, a part of this larger picture. Right. I don't know if I talk, articulated that exactly. Yeah, no, what, that's the just way it. I was thinking it. Oh, absolutely. But. And I think that's what psychedelics kind of revealed to me, at least ayahuasca. I just realized I was so interconnected with everything. And I think that's the beauty of some of these plant medicines is they really get you in touch and real get you to realize that you're you're not separate than a tiny gut microbe in the environment or whatever you're it's it's all there's all this synchronicity there's always this symbiotic relationship between mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. and you disturb one thing it it always has an impact somewhere else so like if you we if we destroy land for farming and we're destroying the climates like in the rainforest we're chopping down you know palm trees you know, for palm oil to put in, you know, a variety of different products and what downstream impacts is that going to have? Who knows, but mm -hmm. we're, it, it's going to have some downstream impacts. And a lot of those are carbon based, you know, we're having too much carbon in the atmosphere, which is a huge, huge issue for climate change. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when people talk about climate change and they're talking about that, they're talking about a lot of people reference like, oh, fossil fuels, you know, we're burning too many fossil fuels. So we need, you know, solar power and these other things as a, is, is the main issue behind climate change. And it's like, that's part of it. But the majority of it is the farming, the agriculture piece of it, because the main purpose behind not doing conventional farming is that if you do like regenerative agriculture is you're sequestering a lot of that carbon that's in the atmosphere and you're pulling it back down into the soil. Mm -hmm. And so you're creating healthy soil, you're creating more healthy plants. So you, you start to re rebuild that cycle that we're talking about, that symbiotic cycle 
you're starting to rebuild that when you when you get away from the chemical inputs and the you know the non-traditional not how things are you know if you we get back to before there was chemical farm you know chemical inputs and traditional tilling of the farming when you probably the native americans were here you know and they were doing their th you know they're hunting buffalo and the buffalo were trampling the land and they were eating the grasses and they were pooping on the land and mm -hmm. so when the indians grew their their three sisters the squash the acorn and uh forget the other one peas i think it is but they they called it the three sisters you know when they would do their farming i mean they didn't need any they would just you know plant the, the food nutrients the, were there the new the, yeah because all the lands were perfectly and the fertilized was had, right yeah the natural the state of how things were obviously we can't get back to there i mean we're already in we're already, we're in the shit right now we're we need in the modern culture. solutions we're in babylon this so, modern issue yeah we right. need so we need modern solutions and we need conversations like this that Say, okay, what can we do as non-farmers, as people that are just regular, you know, consumers, what can we do to, to change the scope of what's going on? And to me, it starts with, you know, voting with the dollar bills that are in our wallet, you know, casting the votes with the money that we have. Let's spend it on things that are in support of this stuff. And it, it's not an easy, it's not easy conversation or an easy solution, mm -hmm. but it, it's the start. It's mm -hmm. a start to, to start somewhere and, you know, growing your own food. If you have a backyard, I mean, that's huge. You know, I started growing my own food, you know, potatoes, small things. You know, I, I grow, get most of my food from the grocery store, but just doing little things to, to start to change the conversation. So even if it doesn't happen in our generation, maybe the next generation or the generation after that, mm -hmm. the, this incremental change we're, it can, we're it can build up through fast. this conversation we're like planting the seed of absolutely that too, right? anybody who listens to it you know grow up grow some mint in your window grow right. some cilantro it's easy you get a pot you put some cilantro seeds put it in the window i've been wanting basil really bad because i cook with a lot of basil like yeah. i should definitely have a ba remember when we well <laughs> my girlfriend's over there we were, we were looking at we there was a basil plant at the at the grocery store one day and i was like i, I should have that i should get that but <laughs> Like now I know like for sure I like I I need to actually take those steps, right? Cuz yeah. I'm like conscious of this conversation, but I personally haven't done enough to to really affect that change myself. Um I was just going to say I have a suggestion with that with your food with carrots and I've noticed green onions, you can put it in just a little bit of water and it'll start to like grow up and then yeah. you can plant plot it and you already bought it from the grocery store, so there you go. You just I've done it with uh, green onions, and uh, I want to do it with carrots when I actually have the, a bigger space to do it. But, I mean, you bought it from the grocery store. Now you can have and make your own mm. and do with your own. And I've seen it. You can see it on, uh, what is it, like different TikToks or, like, Facebook videos. Mm -hmm. Like, here's this plant. And then they'll, you know, cut off the tip of it. And you can watch it. The, the uh, green onion will grow, like, about this tall, and then you can put it in a little plot, and it'll grow when you have green onions yeah you, that's right there. <laughs> that's one thing that she's been fascinated with recently that's been kind of exciting was sending me a bunch of stuff like of how to like limit waste and like different products that are available on the market like you know uh, like tablets for for like mouthwash right so you're not buying single-use plastic or yeah. like different things like that or different tips like of like jarring vegetables in water so that they don't go bad and like like what you brought up like using the stuff that you're purchasing once to like regrow because you you, you can do that and yeah. we definitely should be doing that right yeah composting too and that's a huge one even if you don't have a garden in per se in your backyard i mean just taking your leftover scraps from fruits and vegetables and eggshells or whatever and throwing it in a big bucket and then returning it to the earth somewhere so it doesn't end up in a landfill. I know they're starting an initiative in California and San Francisco um, where they actually have compost bins for everybody. And the more you put in your compost bin and the less you put in your regular bin, the less they charge you. Mm -hmm. So it really incentivizes people to compost their scraps. And so they're taking those, you know, I think it's 700 tons of food every day mm -hmm. in san francisco that's a lot of food those are the type of like comp they're putting it back into the earth those are the type of regulations that i, I really appreciate right Absolutely. where it's like it's incentivizing someone to do things that are going to be more positive and impactful long term but it's not like you ha you're it's not forced 
to comply, right? But if you want to save yourself a couple bucks, you're gonna you're gonna take exactly. you're gonna take this, and this. you can feel good about you know not just throwing it away, stuff that should be put back into the earth, and that's ending up that compost is gonna end up on somebody's farm somewhere and put back into the soil, growing more plants. So it, there's a cyclical relationship with all that stuff, and mm. I think the more that we can get to that point. I don't know, you know, how to, you know, exactly jump to there, but look, little changes, any change you can do is good. So it's like definitely awareness. I yeah, think is just awareness. Large, and making it like somewhat the norm to be conscious of how much you waste, not using plastic, you know, th those types of things. Like because it, right now it's not necessary. It's growing to be more so the social norm, but it's not necessarily right. right? Like you still like. I'm still buying like plastic water bottles when I know for a fact I should be using a reusable water bottle, right? And my my rationale is like I drink a shit ton of water, so I need like when I leave the house I can't just have just one of these or just one refillable water. I'm gonna need to refill it multiple times. Like that's my excuse, but I know that's like just a bullshit excuse. I could get I could figure some I could keep a five gallon jug in my trunk yeah. to refill my my refillable water bottle if I wanted to. Yeah, which that. now I feel like I'll probably do something like that because I said it out <laughs> loud. You know, it, ma it made it more real and I feel more guilty to not do that now. Yeah, I actually go to a, a um, sorry, I, didn't want, I know you want to say something, just like get this out there while it's still in my head. Uh, um, natural springs. There's natural springs all over Minnesota. Mm -hmm. In every state, they have natural spring water. And there's one in Eden Prairie right by Shaka Theodore Worth. What's it called? Theodore Worth. Or no, no, Fre not Frederick Peter, Miller. Frederick Miller. Yeah, yeah it's one of those. It, one of those two named. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. I, I've been there quite a few times. That's why I, I thought I could say it so confidently, but I had the name wrong. Cl close <laughs> enough. Close enough. You got the right idea. Theodore so Worth it, is where I go biking. It, it is uh, <laughs> called Frederick Miller Spring, and it's awesome because it's natural spring water that's out of the ground. It's free, so I have like ten different five gallon jugs, and I load in the back of my truck, and I go fill them all up. Store them in my basement, and that's and it, all I and drink. And it's spring water. You know, spring you, there's water. more. There's actually more in it for your body to have. Am the, I wrong? The natural electrolytes. You know, electrolytes are so huge. I don't think people realize just how I geek out on electrolytes. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> like, no, I, I want to hear it. This is okay. specifically like added right. electrolyte. So you have water. electrolyte water. I drink like PD, that... I drink Pedialyte somewhat regularly. <laughs> you know. There's another conversation we should have on PDLA. It's okay. not exactly good for you. <laughs> like, oh, shit. So maybe I should chill on it. Maybe. We'll talk about that. Okay. I, I can go on a, a lot of tangents, but I won't go on that one right now. Uh, so electrolyte water, you probably paid a couple bucks for that. Mm -hmm. and, and it's got great stuff in it. It's got magnesium, sodium, uh, boron, um, uh, uh, sulfur, all the natural things that our body needs. Like we need those micronutrients for just about every function in our body, brain function, generation of serotonin in our gut, everything revolves around what those, what, are, what, how our body metabolizes those micronutrients. And so, electrolyte water is huge because we, our mitochondria, for one of the reasons it is, is because our mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of our cell, everybody learns that in, mm -hmm. you know, you know, second grade biology. Or That's like one thing <laughs> that I learned in science that like. I hear regularly. You know? Right. Everybody's <laughs> like, oh, the mitochondria, you know, they, they make power. The powerhouse. Like the yeah. powerhouse of the cell. It was like when you were doing the homework and you had to like draw <laughs> yep. the lines between the meanings of things. Like, yep. what, what does this do? What it's is like it? the powerhouse. Yeah. Yep. It's exactly that. So, okay. So the, the mitochondria do make power. And we think that, you know, it's just like. They do a lot of other things besides make power, but make, you know, make it's called ATP energy. And so our body takes in glucose, you know, through food and through electrolytes and water and generates ATP energy. So in a way, having electrolytes in your water helps you get, have more energy throughout the day. So people drink coffee to get their energy for, through caffeine as a stimulant. You can generate that stuff naturally by optimizing your, your ATP generation through your mitochondria mm -hmm. and electrolyte water is a huge catalyst for that because it needs i think two molecules of water for every one unit of atp energy i'm not exactly sure but i'm pretty sure that's the ratio so all the water you drink is effectively going into that energy production from your mitochondria 
And so the the more that 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 process works, so the more efficient it is. I mean, obviously the more energy, but also the less inflammation too, because the if your your mitochondria aren't generating ATP the way they should be, then it it causes an oxidative process. I won't get into exactly the I won't geek out on it too much, but it creates oxidation. And so we know that oxidation, the more you have, the more your body is going to become inflamed. So if you mm -hmm. have like any kind of inflammation or and it can manifest that's in interesting way. the same process that like causes inflammation a lot of times for a lot of people is like the process that causes rust too right isn't it oxid oxidation yeah, that is exactly is, it. Is, you're rusty you're all oh, you're not movable so there's like yeah there's definitely <laughs> that's exactly it and mm. so it's the same principle in your cell not like your cells are going to rust right but the the, the like <laughs> the integrity of that cell is absolutely kind of dwindling right when absolutely it's, when it's not so there's, hydrated there's a direct, or... there's a direct in, a correlation between health and energy production and oxidation and inflammation you're we're always messing with that balance up and down. And so the more things you can do, like hydrate with good quality spring water, the more it's going to, and it, it, you need intercell. We have extracellular hydration and intercellular. So a, a majority of our water is supposed to be intercellular because our body can make use of it. Right. Mm -hmm. our, our things like our mitochondria can use it to generate ATP. If you don't have good intercellular water, then you're going to get, um, you won't be as energized. You won't, you won't make energy as efficiently. And the thing is, is as we age, as we were talking about earlier, you know, age, you start to degrade and function. Mitochondria age is one of the huge reasons behind that. Is right, that like your cellular age, right? That's right. A, there's they, a bio, they... You have a physical age and you have a biological age. And so the biological age is how, how basically how degraded your mitochondria have become. Hmm. And so that's a huge, I like, I like <laughs> how intuitively I've always like leaned towards spring water. I didn't really know why, you know, my simple answer would be like, uh, micronutrients or whatever, right, but right. I didn't know what that was. We don't now, know why, but we know it's good. <laughs> yeah. But it seems like now I have like a better understanding as to why actually, yeah, spring water is going to be better for my my health and maybe even my longevity too, if I'm keeping up and supporting the, the strength and vitality of my mitochondria, right? By feeding it proper nutrients. Yep. Yeah. Um, and it's cool. Like the, there's also, okay. There's also reverse osmosis water and distilled water. Um, and both of them act differently in, in your body. So, you know, I won't go too in deep into it, but if you drink distilled water, it's going to pull toxins out of your cell because of the charge. Every, the water has a charge to it, either positive or negative or neutral. Um, so distilled water, I believe, has a negative charge, or no, positive charge, one or the other. And anyways, the, the, the toxins that are in our cell have an opposite charge to distilled water, so it pulls those toxins out. So if you ever want to detox, distilled water is, is way better than even spring water to do, to, to just detox yourself. If you have, you know, if you're taking in a lot of garbage, a lot of heavy metals, Go on a, a water fast for three days with this distilled water. You're going to pull all of that out of your cells. And you're going to feel a lot better at the end of the three days. But in the general day-to-day -day drinking water, spring water is where it's at because you, you get all those, those micronutrients that are, that are hydrating your cells and, and creating that, 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 that ATP generation and the anti-inflammatory uh, response from all the, from all the, from so the you told me cellular about, level. So you told me about distilled water. Tell me about alkaline water then. Is what what impact would alkaline water be having on a uh, cellular level? Um, so al if, al if you know, I yeah, guess. no, alkalinity I think is uh, is based on like uh, the ions that are in your in your water, or it or the actually the ions are attached to the micronutrients. So if you have like magnesium and sulfur and stuff in your water, that makes it more alkaline so you're drinking that's it says electrolyte water but it's basically it probably has a high alkalinity so it's it, it if you if you, in our body we have a, acidity which is like low alkaline and then we have alkaline you know which is like a high high ph mm -hmm. so there's always that balance there and so the more you know you the more good stuff you have in your water the more you're going to get that alkaline response and that so i th I, I know i jacked that up but that's basically the the theory behind it is like the the higher the ph the more stuff you have in there that's good like the different micronutrients mm -hmm. and so that's yeah so i'm gonna take it back just a little bit so t talk to me about how 
you being conscious with your your food choices and the the way that you're feeding your food, how has that affected your um, second diagnosis with that autoimmune disorder that we talked about a little bit earlier? Yeah, so after I started changing my diet and going more, pretty much for the past five years, I've been all organic. Like uh, probably 90%. I still eat Chipotle every once in a while. I still mm-hmm. get down with, you know, non-organic stuff. But not you so know, much Pizza Ranch. Not so much Pizza Ranch Damn. anymore. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I just, I just started to go for it and realize that I'm going to have to reduce my toxins if I want to mitigate some of these. Because I was having some bad swelling, like even last year. And I couldn't even walk. I was in the. I ended up in the hospital a couple times because I just get my inflammation was so bad, and so yeah, my body was just not having it. Like I, I realized that I have to get more clean with what I'm putting in my body because my body's more. Some people are more sensitive than others. Obviously, I, I'm really sensitive to these things, and so I realized that I had to start e- eating organic food and taking in clean sources of water. And I've, I noticed an immediate difference. Like after doing it for like hardcore, like three months, I started to realize that, yeah, wow, this is having a huge, huge difference. My, I wasn't taking any drugs. And usually with my condition, you need to take a, a, a biweekly injection of Humira mm-hmm. or some kind of uh, uh, biologic or TNF blocker to get those artificial antibodies in your system. And I didn't need to take it. I haven't taken it in a long time. There's, and and it, I have no other reason to say or no other way to explain it other than I've cleaned up what I'm putting in my body. Mm-hmm. I love I love how multiple times in this conversation you answer the question that I have in my head. <laughs> and I don't even have to say anything because you went directly to where I was thinking. So. Well, through my clean diet, I've also developed telepathy. So, like, I can read <laughs> that, what's That's going where I was on. going next, you know? Like, <laughs> hey, we're, we're, all, we're all one, so we're all kind of a hive mind. We're definitely, <laughs> we're definitely in tune, you know, um, in sync, right? Absolutely. Um, so, man, we, wow, okay, we've covered a lot. Yeah. I don't yeah. quite know where to go next. Yeah, I, I don't know either, how, man. Do you, is like, there anything you feel like we, wow. we haven't covered that substantially that you wanted to kind of talk about? Yeah, I don't know. Like you said, there's a lot of directions we can go. Uh, I guess maybe a little bit of the politics behind, like, what the national sentiment is behind climate change and what it is. Like I alluded to earlier, like, a lot of people talk climate change. Oh, fossil fuels, you know, we got to stop extracting fossil fuels and go to solar and wind power immediately. And it's like okay, we can't, that's, that's part of the conversation. But like I said, the agriculture is even a bigger part of the conversation yeah, we, or we at al- least an equal part of the conversation. We alluded I think to they it. work together. We alluded to it before being that like restoring the health of our soil and allowing, and like in kids ground, they talk about allowing the soil to become a carbon sink again, yeah. like it's supposed to be. Right. Yeah. So the desertification of like our, 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 Field and fields and our lands and, and tilling these lands and destroying the vitality of that soil and turning it into dirt is is in a lot of a lot of ways driving also one of the catalysts driving um, climate change right and yeah. push, continuing to push that forward because there's going to be more carbon in our air if our our soil is less able to absorb it right yeah yeah absolutely and um, one of the things that they've done is. Um, in 2015, there was uh, um, a climate or a climate change summit in Paris called COP21, and um, all the major con- countries showed up for this this summit to talk about climate change and talk about some of the solutions for it, except for the U.S. and China and India. So three of the m- three of the main co- uh, countries that are all contributing mostly to climate change due to the fact that those are the three top countries spraying glyphosate and all these chemical you know, conventional ways of farming. Those are the three top countries that are doing that. And so they didn't show up to this, this summit. And when people talk about Trump pulling out of the Paris agreement, that's what they're referring to. Trump, we, I think we initially, I'm not sure the, exactly the politics that went into it, but I think initially after that summit happened, even though we didn't sign up for it, I th- believe Obama probably, I think he agreed to be part of the Paris agreement and signed off on it. But when Trump came into office he you know famously 
pulled out of the Paris mm-hmm. Agreement, and that that's the and the his ma- reasoning was like economically, this is a bad deal for America. Is there any anything substantiating that that it was economically a bad deal for America being a part of the Paris Agreement, or is it solely because we would have to rethink our 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 methods and the way we are producing fossil fuels in our country, the way we're um, the our carbon emissions? Is that or that, that you're, that's spot on. That's okay. exactly it. it. It's not. It, it's a bad deal for us, yes, because of what you just mentioned. We have to like, come up with solutions we now. We have to come up with a solution to, that's going to adhere money. to these um, regulations that we're essentially signing ourselves up for. Absolutely, and, and it, it's a whole economic discussion that goes really, really deep into why this stuff is the way it is. It's because we subsidize those those monocrop farmers to like 25 to 40 billion dollars a year we're giving those subsidies encouraging these farmers to grow the way they do and so when you have a farmer like picture you're a farmer and you have a piece of land and you want to grow something on it mm-hmm. what are you gonna you're gonna grow whatever makes you the most money right mm-hmm. that's what most farmers are gonna do and rightly so they should or you know to take care of their family we all have to you know have <clears throat> do that so farmers are going to, of course, go with the easy money. They're going to get government subsidies, so they're guaranteed to make money. Mm-hmm. No matter how they grow, as long as they produce a bushel of corn, they're going to get paid X amount of dollars because they produce a bushel of corn. Mm-hmm. And so all of that structure is completely tied into the economy and the way things are 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 for these farmers to get loans for their farm equipment, for the chemicals that go into the farming. Mm-hmm. If, if you're a bank, you're not going to give a loan to that farmer that doesn't have a guaranteed, guaranteed income. income. Yeah. So it's this that's, cycle that's of economy. That's one thing that definitely stood out to me um, in Kiss the Ground too is I think, I don't know if his name is Larry or what, the, the, yeah, the one co- of the farmers that they had highlighted kind of, he was referring to those subsidies as welfare, right? Yeah. And that seems like that's an appropriate way to look at it, right? It, it, it absolutely is a form of welfare because you have absolutely. a guarantee of what your income is going to be if you decide to produce what is being bought by the U S government. Right. And, and yeah, I thought that was just an interesting, um, you know, turn, you know, like different way to look at it. Like it, cause it is, it really is a welfare. Right. Yeah. And they talk about, um, the amount of money that you make as a conventional farmer, you make like $3 an acre. So if you have X amount of hundreds of acres, you make $3 an acre based on, you know, all the chemicals you have to put in and then Mm -hmm. the net output. So you're getting very little dollars. You're only profiting $3, right? It's not compared to what, because of all the inputs, like you just said, yeah, go ahead. Right, right, yeah. And so, yeah, so that, and so you're guaranteed that $3. And if you have a thousand acres, you know, you get X amount, you know, X amount of money every every harvest let's say but the organic farmer the larry i forget his name i think his name is larry um he's making a hundred dollars per acre and it takes him more time and and to get that to go from you know the conventional way to go to an organic farm farming because you you it takes more effort you mm-hmm. have to put more effort into and it thought and yeah yeah you know? it, and and you and also the the uh the way that he's doing it is um he's using animals to kind of get back into that old cycle that I was talking about, like the Native Americans had with the buffaloes that would roam the lands and eat the grass, poop on the grass. He's doing the same thing with cows. Mm-hmm. He's taking the cows in one area and having them um, pass, you know, eat the grasses in the land, and then they move the cows to a different area, a different acre, and then they plant you know, food that's on the acre that had been fertilized by the cows. So there's that natural life cycle that he's involved in. So he's growing fruits and vegetables, and he's raising meat, which is a huge, huge discussion right now because it's like, okay, so there's like, you know, people are like vegan or anti-vegan and saying, well, an- all animal agriculture is bad, so we have to go vegan for the animals. And it's like, it, it, that makes sense on, on some level, but on another level, you're taking away from the natural cycles of how things should be or could be to create a more regenerative way of farming in a way that involves the animals and involves the land so you're creating more of a harmony that mm-hmm. and to restore that back into the land back into the agricultural practice itself so the first time that i was like exposed to the concept of um like regenerative farming was listening to joe rogan the joe mm. rogan experience and i think it was um oh i forgot his name i just looked it up the other day um was it salatin 
I don't know. I haven't seen um, that one. But so there was. There's just this this like. There's a lot of podcasts out there that are talking about this stuff. It's really cool. Yeah, it's awesome to see. I didn't know Rogan had uh, someone on like. Yeah, yeah. He's had, looking at that. He's had this. multiple people on now talking similarly about this topic. Um, but this this one gentleman, it was the first time that I had been exposed to it. I wish I could think of his name. I'm kind of frustrated that I can't. <laughs> but um, the he was the first time I had been exposed to the concept. But his angle was like about you know, um, uh the the quality of our food and and the way that the the how much we get out of like having that higher quality more organic food and and just like the balance and whatnot i think that one of the most compelling things to me that i hadn't heard in this realm of conversation is is using like restoring soil health and using it to combat climate change i just that the in 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 using our soil as the natural carbon sink that it was, you know, intended to be. I just keep thinking of how like that point is so compelling because we look at like climate change and a lot of, I think a lot of the research that people might point to right now is how like, you know, farting cows and, um, you know, cars and fossil fuels and, um, you know, like our, 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 uh, our waste, um, like landfills and things like that as like the problems that are emitting so much carbon into the air. Right. But then finally now it's like, we're considering like the natural remedy as to where that carbon is intended to go. Although right. some of those practices certainly need to be, you know, dialed in and tamed a little bit, probably in the long term, looking into our future yeah. as far as, you know, factory farming, um, how much waste that we have and what we do with our waste and then our usage of fossil fuels, right? Those are definitely things we need to look at to combat climate change, yeah. but also this restorative, um, this this regenerative and this method of restoring the, the health to our soil and, and restoring that natural place for the carbon to go is, I think, I don't know, just really compelling. It's, it's it just huge. really stands it's out It's absolutely to me. huge. And it's only been the past couple of years where I've realized how important it is and how how profound it is for our future, for Rio's generation, for the next generation after that. It, it's so, so important because if we don't take care of this, we're going to keep emitting more and more carbon. And there's going to be a point where there's like a tipping point of no return where our farm, you know, where, where the land won't be repairable and people are going to starve. And mm -hmm. it's it it may seem like gloom and doom, but it, and it is it, it, it's absolutely that we can't consider continue the on the road the road we are it just not it's not sustainable mm -hmm. it's, it's just not definitely so in your personal journey you i know a lot a lot of like what you've come up with and the, the research you've done has been like independent right yeah, yeah. um research, and, yeah. and in in response to taking you know control of your own health and then you know, i'm sure you kind of fell into the rabbit hole a little bit and it, it it sounds like it took you multiple different directions yeah, yeah. of things to look into. And, and I think you alluded to me before we ever recorded, but that you're, you're also considering a master's program potentially in the, in the same realm of, of, uh, thinking. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So like I mentioned, I've been a computer guy, it in the it industry for the past 20 years. So behind, behind a computer every day, typing, you know, programming, writing code and, and you do so, not look like a computer programmer. I, I, I've kind of evolved over you time. Okay. I just showed Rhea a picture of all my past driver's licenses that I found. Like, I have all my licenses saved since I was 17 yeah. for some reason. Okay. I don't know. I'm a freak. I, I, it's funny. I, like, I have a little – not that I'm old. But like, not, I'm not very old. I've only had like four or five licenses, but I also am saving them too. Yeah, I'll for, show you the picture after know. this is done. And it's, it's funny to see my evolution come to where I am now. And even now with the beard and like, you know, I've turned into, you know, kind of – the the hippie wook i guess you would say yeah, like, yeah. that's what kind of people know i didn't want to say that myself jason's but. kind of the hippie guy <laughs> and uh you know i work from home so i'm allowed to let the beer grow i don't have to be in an office so it's like whatever you know and yeah. my neighbors kind of look at me like oh he's kind of like you know what's he doing you know like you know so i'm kind of looked at as like the oddball but yeah yeah but fuck their judgment you right know? right no any, i'm just doing me man like uh, yeah. I, I don't give a fuck like yeah i i know what's important to me and that's you know I, you know i'm this is the path that I'm on, so whatever. I you don't. Set your, you you're 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 confident in your intention. Absolutely, yeah, I yeah. think <laughs> that was part of what we I talked about a little bit in the last podcast with somebody. It was like if you know what your intentions are and like that you are intending to have a positive impact on the world around you, then like fuck how I look and how people think of the way that I look because I know I'm just trying to affect positivity. You know. Yeah. 
Right. And I think it's about being authentic. Like my entire life, I know, like, I haven't been authentic. Like I know I, I've, I've kind of just gone along to get along. Mm. And, and there's a price that comes with that. When you're not your authentic self, you start to adapt qualities from the people around you. Yeah. And eventually you get tired of your own bullshit. <laughs> Let, yeah. Let's be honest. Like, and, and you start to get more addicted or not addicted, more you have a stronger desire to, to let that authenticity come through you and not give a fuck about what anybody has to say about it. Mm -hmm. You know, you're confident in what you're doing. And so that's kind of the road that I've been taking with some of this stuff and realize I'm not a computer programmer. Like I'm good with computers. I can write code and I can make software, but I don't have a passion for it. I've never had a passion for it. When I was in school in Minnesota state back 20 years ago, um, they, I didn't know what I, I went to law for law enforcement. That was my major when I first enrolled because I didn't know what I wanted to be a cop when I was a kid. That was my I was like, I want to be that because I didn't know what else I wanted to be. So I never had that that drive. But I've always been good with technology and computers. And so my advisor said, you know, well, what do you want to be? And I was like, well, I don't know, I guess, you know, law enforcement. I want, wanted to be a cop when I was a kid. She's like, well, what are your objectives? And she, she got me to look at some of this stuff. And I was like, well, I've got Rhea and I've, you know, I've got a kid on the way. And so I need to make some money. Like, mm -hmm. you know, let's be real. I need to make as much money as possible to pay off this debt that I'm going to be done, you know, need to pay off after I get done with school. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I want to give a good life to my kids and support them and, you know, give them something. And so, you know, that was kind of the direction. She's like, well, computers and the medical industry are the two biggest industry. This is back in like... 1998 or, or so, like, yeah, we live around there. And so I was like, well, I guess I'm good with computers, so I guess I'll switch my major to that because I want, I want to make some money. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the path I've been on, and I've been doing that. And, and I have made a lot of money in the computer industry, and, but after a while, money starts to not matter so much to you, and you start to look at what's going on in your own life and what's going on in my kid's life and the world around me, and, like, man, I can either choose to be a programmer for the next 20 years and make an awful lot of money, or I can do something that I'm, my, my spirit, my soul is going to resonate with. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of what that's kind of been the impetus on why I've wanted to, you know, make a career change and kind of involve technology, but get more into the health stuff. Obviously I have a passion for food and, 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 and health and my own health and, and helping other people do that too. And so I've been looking at different programs, um, for the U of M actually, they have um, um, a health and wellness coaching uh, master's program, which just started in the past five years. Um, it's through the Earl Bakken Spirituality Center. Okay. And it's a master's of arts degree, so it's not um, like a science degree. It isn't like an official, um, you know, I won't have a, like a medical degree, but I will, if I go that route, I can get my master's in health coaching, which is a new field that's really taking off. And even like, places like the Mayo Clinic and health partners. Mm. And a lot of these high-end medical, um, you know, groups are actually asking these, the, you know, more and more people to become health coaches because they need kind of that intermediary between the doctor and what happens when they get out of the hospital or people are even asking for these holistic things that right. are in hospital That's what hospital I'm trying setting. to think about immediately is it like it makes me somewhat optimistic to know that these programs are being – you know, adopted by some of the larger health systems because yeah. it seems like it's going to be a perfect conduit to someone like you who thinks about these things and bring you to a room with some people that, you know, that are more traditionally conventionally trained, you know, in some ways, not specifically not to think about these things. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. more of that, that terrain versus germ theory. Again, it's like the, the doctors got, you know, the, the germ theory handled, they've got it that they, they can treat the goldfish, but they need someone to treat the, the, the water too and mm -hmm. the surroundings and they need someone who understands both the medical side of it and the, the, the other side, the health part of it and for more of a preventative way right. of, of not getting sick to begin with right. you can, you know, like if that's the optimal way, obviously if you, to prevent sickness, you prevent getting sick to begin with. Not, right. You can also, but when you do get sick, 
you know, you have a doctor there. If you if you break your leg, I'm not going to be able to help you. Well, if we, like, if, I feel like, like if we have more preventative measures, we'll free ourselves up to think about better solutions for exactly. for like real ailments that you know couldn't have been prevented, right? Like right. if we if we if we you know, in a lot of ways, like diabetes can be prevented in a lot of the cases that that come up. It's in um, not only like diabetes, but that was just the only like really thing I could think of. But I just know that there's a lot of things that could be halted before it becomes an issue and if we're thinking in that realm i think i already said this but it frees us up it gives us capacity to really think about more positive solutions for things that you can't prevent absolutely i just said that twice i don't know no i think it's absolutely it and especially in this time where covid's such a huge deal in our in our culture it's like people should be taking this stuff seriously so we understand what these impact what a virus is and how it's interacting in our body and what's it what's it doing and how we can prevent the virus from basically a virus is not alive our body has to multiply it our cells the virus has to come into our system and our cell has to decide hmm do i get rid of this or do i regenerate it or to multiply it and cause it to you know proliferate proliferate um and so that process happens with your immune system. If your immune system is functioning, that's why you're not seeing babies with COVID or younger people get, you know, be impacted by this virus. It's because their immune system is coming in, sweeping it out, and it's done. They're, they're not being affected by it. Mm. And so the more we can be proactive, you know, this isn't going to be the last virus that comes. I mean, we saw SARS in 2002 and MERS in 2012. So it's like on a 10-year release schedule. Those are both coronaviruses. Mm -hmm. And so this is another coronavirus. Yeah, I think, there's, I think there's a misunderstanding that, like, we call it coronavirus, but, like, coronavirus is a class of viruses. It's just it. It's, the flu is a coronavirus. It's a, it's a SARS. It's, a, it's a, another branch of, like, SARS, I believe. Yeah. Um, it, it, obviously, it's mutated and it's different. Mm -hmm. And so they're calling it the new novel, you know, coronavirus. But this isn't the first one. It won't be the last one. So it's like instead it is, of the official name is SARS CoV nineteen, right, right? Yeah, that's exactly uh, that's what it's actually. Yeah, yeah. So it, and it's just that, and it's like of course, and people are looking at a vaccine now. It's like okay, we can we can treat the you know use that, or we can start looking at why our physiology isn't able to cope with mm -hmm. this virus to begin we can with, strengthen or viruses the, in general. The foundation and yeah, the, our our cell health and our immune system. That's to, just it to to fight this as opposed to spending all this money and researching uh, a vaccine that could be potentially harmful and have other impacts longer term, especially when we try to rush it because we, yeah. we, that we haven't allocated the proper time to see what type of things could onset after treatment with that, with said vaccine, mm -hmm. um, which is a, a bit worrisome. <laughs> but, oh, absolutely. Um, okay. So I'm getting close to wanting to wrap it up simply because, one, we've covered a lot of really good yeah. stuff. It's been a great conversation. Absolutely. Right around the hour 45 mark, my computer starts to lag a bit. Oh, okay. And I'm like, I just don't. Because the file gets pretty big. I don't <laughs> want it to crash like when we're in the middle of, of, of talking and not have a clean like transition right, out of the conversation. Right. So I think we're about at that time. Um, is there sorry, hug the microphone. You got anything no, else to say? We, no, no we, not really. I'm sorry. It's Don't okay. be sorry. But we, I think we we I knew that was. We no, knew I get that to I get to learn. It's really great. I've I've loved I've loved watching you grow and like sh just shift your whole life around because I got to see you as a computer programmer and now I see you as this person and you are a hundred times happier and whole and um more present as a dad even though i'm an adult i'm still gonna need you until i'm, I'm until you die so I, it's good to to see you create some longevity in your own life in, in the, these ways and it helps me too really ultimately it does i, I take notes i don't always listen that's because i've had that problem forever but <laughs> <laughs> but it's good to have the information there and it's awesome that you're spending so much time because this doesn't just benefit you this benefits all of us really like by you taking all this time to do this so I'm glad you got to, to I know this is something you just you love to do. <laughs> so I'm glad you got to do it. Is it show? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I just really like helping people. You know? like, I like helping myself and like, how can I share this with people? Yeah. You know, in a way that they're going to understand. And I think like having podcasts like this or just even conversations like this is, mm. is awesome. Yeah. yeah that's a, and a large part of what compels me to want to do the podcast is to expose people to someone like you who has thought a lot about this and you can 
bring to the table the things that you think about, right? It's like we and, and, and now deliver that into like our our hive mind and our group conscious is now like we plant the seed into e- even if it's only a thousand people that listen to this, you know, it's a thousand people that are exposed to these ideas that we're talking about, right? And that could have trickling effect more longer term. So um, I would also want to express the same like appreciation and gratitude for the time that you um, put towards this topic specifically. And I think uh, personally, I really do see the importance of, of you know, regenerative agriculture and, and, and taking into account the way that we interact with the world around us and the long term impacts that it has. Um, so it's exciting to talk deeper about on this level. Um, with that, do you have anything else that you want to conclude with no i just pulled a 16 hour shift yeah (laughs) you're ready to go back to sleep or back back to to, chilling at least Yeah, back to sleep how about you jason you got anything i'm good yeah um if anybody had like i said watch kiss the ground uh great documentary and then there's another one that just came out too um with with uh david attenborough um one he's a world famous like uh I uh, love David Attenborough. Yeah, he, he, yeah, I'm pretty sure he he like he is the voiceover for like all the right. most popular um, like uh, what what's it called Earth or yeah the agricultural documentaries the Earth you know environmental yeah. stuff. I mean, he just released a new one and he's like ninety something. But this one kind of sums up everything that's happening on a global scale. What's that one called? Um, uh, a life on our planet or something a like that. Life in our planet or on our planet. Um, something like that. A life I've, on our planet, something like that. Yeah, you'll find it. I'm it's, sure we'll find it with that. Right. I'll and, probably and that's watch a it beautiful tonight. documentary too cuz it it not only it doesn't talk too much about agriculture though, it does a little bit, but they're talking about more about stuff that's going on in the rainforest and what's going on globally, you know, with a lot of different things like fossil fuels and so he he go into a lot of different things. So that's another beautiful one. Um but yeah, this stuff is it, it's important and it's also getting more prevalent in the education system. The fact that they have a master's program now that talks about how all of this holistic stuff ties in together. And a lot of, you know, it's, I think that's really encouraging. Like you're talking about and like health partners in the Mayo clinic and these insurance companies are talking about the need for this kind of holistic way of thinking Mm -hmm. and combining like mind, body, and spirit stuff together and realizing that we're not just our bodies we're not just our minds we're we have this intricate piece of who we are and that connectedness mm-hmm. that we have that that every aspect matters and and our relationship with the earth matters like you said it's alive it's a living breathing thing and it happens at every level the soil's alive the trees are alive you know the microbes in the soil are alive mm-hmm. so there's life the everywhere. fungus beneath the soil yeah, is did, alive we could do a whole podcast on the fungal networks and how important the fungal that networks that shit is mind blowing <laughs> the, and oh the, God, the yeah. ability that like plant life has to communicate where like i've heard some pretty cool examples of like rainforests like one side of the rainforest like dealing with like a parasite or a termite and then the trees like a thousand miles on the other side of the rainforest are having the same like defensive response as but they're not being faced with the same like parasite or termite it's just they they know through that fungal network most likely that they that they should be responding or they know how these trees over here are responding so they start producing that sap themselves and that's just a so that's just it so when they talk about like mushrooms being an adaptogen have you ever heard that term adaptogen yeah yep. it, so you take it and it, it acts the same way in your body so you take like chaga or turkey tail or mataki or lion's mane all of that stuff restores that communication network that's supposed to be happening inside your body that's mm-hmm. why mushrooms are that's so what's, magical that's what's interesting about psilocybin too right is because it feels like it's reconnecting you to like that on like another level too like it, yep. it's the the i think its effect on your like perception of the world around you is like also reconnecting you just to like whatever whatever that is i don't even know but um it's connecting that mind body spirit mm-hmm. all yeah, together right. it, it's giving you it's giving you a glimpse like you said it carries you to the top of the mountain gives you an, an absolute glimpse of like how you're supposed to and that's why you a lot of world. times you come out of like a heroic dose of psilocybin just feeling refreshed you're like like you you felt like you were just like trapped like in the cell in this cold wet cellar and maybe you went into it kind of sad but then like through that experience you got a chance to be on top of the mountain you have a peak of the entire valley and you're like 
Oh yeah, that's right. I like, how did I forget? This is what it is. I feel great now. You know, it's just like mm-hmm. a, a nice solid reset, refresh reminder of like, yeah. Acid is uh, acid's one thing that's always made me question who I am and mushrooms reassure me of who I am. Mm. Like that's, I feel like that's a huge difference. So that's what, what you said reminded me of like, mushrooms definitely give me that at the end of the day when i'm done with it and the trip is kind of subsided it's like ah oh, i feel so much better in my skin mm-hmm. like i feel like i've Absolutely. opened the windows and everything is out in the open and i feel like i'm at peace and one with and i i just acid really makes me question who i am which is also a good thing to do but it's also good to have that i enjoy i enjoy the mushrooms um uh, in a lot of ways but like when i've had that experience myself of being like reassured of like myself and being like oh yeah I like myself, you know, I I, I helped a couple of my buddies like usher in their first like experiences with mushrooms. I remember um, one of them went to the bathroom like at the end of it and he made the comment like, man, your bathroom has really good lighting. I I like the way I look in your bathroom. And I'm like, hold on. It might not be the bathroom, bro. Like you're on the back end of like an intense psychedelic experience. You might just like what you see in the more or what you see in the mirror more right now. Based on that experience. That's awesome. but, um, all right. We kept talking, even though I said yeah. we we're going to wrap it up. Let's wrap it up. Um, thanks for tuning Don't in you. to the We Are One podcast. I look forward to having both Jason and Rhea back again to chat with us some more as they keep pushing in their own individual personal journeys. Um, but I appreciate the both of you, and I, I really did enjoy the fuck out of this conversation. Yeah, that was awesome, dude. Thank um, you. And seriously, thanks for tuning in. Um, like, subscribe, share, all that silly shit. Um, I need your support to, to continue to grow this platform if you enjoyed the conversation. Remember, we are one, and I say that because like we literally are one in this thing. And um, I couldn't be here without you. And hopefully, um, you know, you're just doing, you're putting your best foot forward, right? Do the best that you can do. Um, there is no community without unity. And and hate just perpetuates hate. Hopefully it's still even recording. Peace out.